Welcome to the Anxiety at Work podcast. I'm Chester Elton, and this is my co-author and dear friend, Adrian Costa. Hey, welcome, everybody. We hope the time you're going to spend with us will help remove the stigma of anxiety and mental health in the workplace and your personal life. We invite experts from the world of work and life to give us ideas and, most importantly, tools to deal with anxiety in our world. And we want to thank our sponsor, LifeGuys. It's a peer-to-peer community that helps people navigate through their day-to-day stressors by providing a place of empathy, listening, wisdom, and support with a guide who has walked in your shoes, experiencing the same challenges of life and experience as you. So here's the great offer. You go to lifeguides.com forward slash schedule a demo and add the code healthy2021 and you get two months of free service. What a great deal. Gotta love it. We also want to thank our sponsor, Go Happy Hub which is the most inclusive and timely way to communicate and engage directly with your frontline employees and candidates with 95% plus open rates. With Go Happy Hub, you can send text messages directly from corporate and enable permissions for your frontline leaders to communicate with their team. They can send notes of gratitude, logistical updates, new hire introductions, etc. You easily can get the right message to the right people. And right now, if you tell them Adrian or Chester sent you, you get 60 days free. Now that's Go Happy Hub. Yeah, it's probably better if you put Adrian, actually, now that I think about it. (laughs) Hey, listen, so those are our great sponsors, and we love them. Our guest today is our new friend, Kelly Greenwood. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Kelly is the founder and CEO of Mindshare Partners. It's a nonprofit that is changing the culture of workplace mental health so that employees and organizations can thrive. She's a Harvard Business Review contributor, a Forbes contributor, and serves as editor-at-large for Mental Health at Work part of Thrive Global. Kelly holds an MBA from Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management and a BA from Duke University. Go Blue Devils. Hey, we're delighted to have you on the show, Kelly. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're, we are delighted to have you, Kelly. We, you know, we've done our background, our research on you, and you've been so open with your struggles with anxiety that it was really touching to us. And, and thank you for that vulnerability you've shown. Now, you say that your manager didn't know what to do with you when you started uh, kind of talking about your anxiety in the workplaces, and you ended up taking a leave of absence. So can you walk us through your mental health journey? Absolutely. And, and for what it's worth, Adrian, uh, I have only been comfortable talking about my mental health experience uh, as of the last several years. So this is still relatively new to me also. Um, so I, I do have generalized anxiety disorder, which I probably had since I was a kid. Um, and while I figured out how to manage it now, um, it has twice led to debilitating depression, including being forced to take a leave of absence from work, as you mentioned. Um, So I've always been extremely high performing. And in a lot of ways, I think my anxiety has actually been a strength and has fueled my ambition. Um, You know, we really don't talk about mental health challenges in a strengths based way nearly enough. Um, But going back to that time, uh, a perfect storm really precipitated that leave of absence. So I was about six months into a new job uh, in a pretty dysfunctional environment, a short staff team and more work than was humanly possible to do. And that was the first time I had ever found myself in a situation like that. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, I had also gone off my medication recently, um, and thanks to a brilliant policy that new hires couldn't work from home on Fridays for their first six months, like everyone else was able to, um, I wasn't able to see my therapist regularly. Uh, This was, of course, when we were all in the office. and I was you know, too afraid and embarrassed to tell my boss the reason why I really needed an exception um, to that policy uh, because I needed to keep my weekly therapy appointment. So if anything, during that time, given all the work stressors, I should have been seeing my therapist more often uh, instead of less. Um, and you know, I was still pretty new to the job, so I was really trying to prove myself and was worried about ruining my reputation by disclosing my anxiety and depression. And at that time, you know, I didn't know any professional peers or role models who had struggled with mental health challenges. Now I find that laughable because since I've been, you know, out, so to speak, uh, so is almost everyone else in my life to me. Um, And uh, that would have been hugely helpful at the time. Um, You know, I had a lot of self-stigma and shame, and I didn't think that, quote unquote, successful people had mental health conditions. And I I did my best to hide my anxiety, especially at work. Um, But when my performance had really clearly deteriorated, I felt like I had no choice um, but to tell my manager what was going on. Um, 
you know, they were really well-meaning but unhelpful, said they'd experienced, you know, um, mental health challenges with people in their personal lives, but never at work, which is statistically impossible. Uh, and they, you know, really didn't know uh, what to do or how to help me navigate the situation. And at that point, I was not in a place to be cognitively problem solving for them. So when I ultimately had to take that leave of absence, I truly believed that my career was over, which which made my anxiety that much worse. Um, you know, I was virtually non-functional and unrecognizable from my usually cheerful and high-performing self. And, um, you know, I was actually really proactively getting help and restarting my medication and, and nothing seemed to be working. Um, you know, thankfully, I ultimately got better and I returned to that job. Um, but despite all of my academic and professional accomplishments, by far the hardest thing I've ever done is to come back from that place and successfully learn how to manage my anxiety, just like I did with my chronic asthma as a kid. Um, so, you know, I think all that is to say is that leave of absence and sort of major downward spiral really could have been prevented with just a few tweaks in the workplace environment, you know, like flexibility in terms of being able to come and go without seeing what specifically it was for. Um, and it really, you know, could have been prevented and, and would have saved me and my organization a lot of personal and professional pain. You know, that journey is more common than we think, isn't it? Like you said, you know, you were good at hiding it. So was everybody else at work. They were good at hiding it as well. So here's, here's the worry, right? So a lot of organizations over COVID, where it's really shown a light on, on mental health, They've made all these changes and improvements. They've tried to make it a safer environment, a more empathetic environment. The fear is, is that as we come out of the pandemic, that we'll shift back to old habits. That again, it'll be, it'll be too hard to talk about. That it'll end your career and so on. So what are the, some of the lessons we've learned over the last couple of years that will help keep empathy high on teams and continue to make it safe? What would you say to that? Yeah, I think that's such an important point. You know, this is such a critical moment in time for leaders to be intentional about our ways of working instead of just, you know, automatically reverting back to the status quo of 2019, you know, especially for, for knowledge workers who've been in a very different um, mode of operating for the last two years. Uh, you know, I think it's important for everyone to remember that mental health is very much a spectrum, right, that includes stress, burnout, and then diagnosable mental health conditions that we all go back and forth on throughout our lives. And so I think it's important to keep that empathy high by remembering how common mental health challenges are. So up to 80% of folks will have a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in their life. They may not know that, but were they to walk into a therapist or doctor's office, they would meet those criteria. Um, so we did a 2021 Mental Health at Work study in partnership with Qualtrics and ServiceNow uh, and found that mental health challenges are now the norm among all employees. So 76% of respondents reported at least one symptom of a mental health condition in the past year, which is up from 15, 59% rather in our 2019 study. So I think keeping that in mind and just keeping the conversations going about genuinely asking how folks are doing and really continuing to lead with compassion. It's, it's not rocket science, right? But it just takes a little bit of intentionality. Um, you know, and I think even if some of the macro stressors that we've faced hopefully dissipate, um, you know, everyone is still going to be struggling with something. And that looks differently from person to person based on their specific circumstances, their unique intersectional identity. And also it's different within the same person at different moments in time. And so it's so important to really keep checking in frequently and and getting that update yeah that's uh, i love that your data is so recent that you know the, the survey you did with qualtrics and and that you have such you know i mean that should be startling to any leader listening right now that three quarters of my workforce have at least one aspect of their mental health that is that is in you know in in jeopardy right now if if we don't pay attention to it. So tell us a little bit more about your work at uh, Mindshare Partners and and how people can find out about you, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, so as uh, as you noted earlier, Mindshare is a nonprofit that's changing the culture of workplace mental health so that both employees and organizations can thrive. So 
ultimately we're looking to normalize what it looks like to have a mental health challenge at work and reduce that stigma and also really address the workplace factors that can contribute to poor mental health so that we don't end up with just a band-aid solution so we do that in three different ways the first is providing workplace training and strategic advising and we really emphasize a proactive preventive approach with a management lens you know we're not we're not focused on crisis situations we're trying to prevent those from happening um, secondly, we host free communities to support leaders of mental health employee resource groups, and we have almost 300 employers represented there. And then lastly, we really work to help build the social movement around workplace mental health. So building public awareness through thought leadership like our writing in HBR and Forbes, free toolkits um, hosted on our website and research and speaking engagements. So you can, you can find out more about us on our website, which is mindsharepartners.org. Um, LinkedIn and Facebook is Mindshare Partners and Twitter is uh, Mindshare.org. So all three of those spots are good places to go. And I encourage everybody to check out your HBR article that's on your website. It's, it's really terrific and uh, a very, you know, a really, uh, a very credible source to, uh, to help begin this process. So now I want to dig into culture too. You know, we're big fans of culture. We wrote a book called All In on Culture. In your practice, you talk about culture. So, so let's get specific. So if I'm a leader right now, what should I be doing in my culture to build a more positive, healthy place for people to work? Absolutely. So as both of you well know, culture change of any kind requires both a top down and bottoms up approach. So in terms of the, the top down leader leader aspect, there's a handful of things that we found to be really effective. Um, the first is being transparent um, and being what we call a leader ally. So this is ideally the CEO, if not someone else in the C-suite, who's really widely sharing their own personal experience with mental health or that of a close family member and friend. And again, we know mental health is a spectrum, can be an experience anywhere on that spectrum, but really gives permission uh, for other people to talk um, about mental health at work if and when they want to, to have a leader do that. Um, and also know that people can be successful and supported at that organization if they do have to navigate a mental health challenge. Um, next, one of the things that we also know, and, and, and you know well, is that you know um, what uh, gets measured gets managed and gets done. Um, so we really recommend uh, pulse surveys for accountability um, to show you know employee engagement if people feel comfortable talking about their mental health at not or not if they feel supported. Um, lots of avenues there to explore. Uh, we also really recommend um, that leaders uh, think about making sure that there's a strong executive sponsor for employee resource groups or affinity groups, both a mental health um, employee resource groups, as well as for other identity groups like women, people of color, the LGBTQ community, um, to really empower those to be as, as successful as they can be, kind of combining that grassroots and leadership um, contributions. And then lastly, you know, one of the most important things that leaders can uniquely do is really address those workplace factors that I was talking about um, that can contribute to poor mental health. And this benefits everybody, right, regardless of whether you have a diagnosable mental health condition or not. Um, but, you know, I think we've seen a lot of employers increase flexibility out of necessity in the pandemic for knowledge workers and really want to see that continue. Um, in our study, an overwhelming 84% of respondents reported that at least one workplace factor um, had negatively impacted their mental health. The most common was emotionally draining work, um, and by that, we define that as stressful, overwhelming, boring, or monotonous, um, and that has worsened since the pandemic, and that was closely followed by work-life balance. And so um, we at Mindshare really talk a lot about inclusive flexibility, so everybody needs something different based on their unique identity or circumstances, and again, you know, that changes from person to person over time. So. Um, we really encourage sort of the senior most leaders to set that culture where flexibility can happen and then for managers to be in charge of checking in with their direct reports to see what they specifically would benefit from and figure out how to make that happen. Um, obviously, setting uh, reasonable expectations on communication turnaround times, things like that uh, also goes a long way. Um, so those are those are really important elements to consider, especially as we as we think about what the future of work looks like. So no specifics, huh, Kelly? Really? Yeah, that's disappointing. Just, yeah, just just that. just those yeah. fifteen things. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. 
Off I the think top the of good news about that, Adrian, <laughs> is that uh, all of these things that I listed, uh, with maybe the exception of the poll survey, are free. Um, they don't cost anything. They just require some focus and intention behind them. So they, uh, again, are pretty to easy to implement if, if you want to. Yeah, you know, my mom used to say, if it's free, it's me. <laughs> so that's, a, that's a, good, uh, a good pitch. You know, great segue into what managers can do. You talked a little bit about, you know, being vulnerable, doing check-ins. So if there were two or three things just really quick, where would managers start? Is it, is it so important to share that story and continue to check in? Are those the top two? And is there anything else just in your triumvirate that you'd say, look, if you're a leader on your team, I would do these three things like right now? Definitely. Uh, well, first off, I was really happy to read in your book that while you believe managers can be doing a lot more to support employee mental health, you're not suggesting that they're trying to be therapists. That's something that we say <laughs> often uh, and couldn't yeah. agree more. I think there's a lot, though, that managers can do while staying in their lane. Um, you know, we don't want managers to try to diagnose folks um, or assume what's going on. You can never tell what's happening with someone. Uh, it may not even be a mental health challenge, but could be lack of sleep uh, due to kids waking up in the middle of the night or maybe just binge watching Ted Lasso or something else. Um, <laughs> but uh, a few of those recommendations for managers, um, building upon the vulnerability part, um, you know, leading with vulnerability is one of the p most powerful ways to normalize mental health ups and downs. And, and we're not suggesting that everyone talk about their mental health if they don't want to. But instead, really just that everyone knows that navigating mental health challenges is part of the human experience and that they're empowered to get that help they need when they need it. Um, and again, if you're not comfortable or don't necessarily have what you consider to be a significant personal mental health story, even just talking about a challenge that you're dealing with, like a kid's temper tantrum, can go a long way in terms of making people feel comfortable um, sharing with you if you want. Um, another part is really modeling mentally healthy behaviors. So even if you as a manager say, you know, oh, you should sign off or you shouldn't log back on when you're on vacation, if people don't see you doing that, they're not going to do it either. So it's really important um, as a manager to, to show that and, and to say that you're doing that, right? Whether that's exercising, you know, taking a lunch break, going around a, a, the block during the day. Um, I note my therapy appointments publicly on my calendar to give people on my team permission to do the same and to do that during work hours. Um, so there's a lot that can be done there just by that modeling. Um, and then, you know, lastly, as you mentioned, the, that culture of connection through check-ins is just, I, I can't overstate that enough. And it's so simple, uh, but it's shocking to me how many of our clients um, and, and people that we talk to at different companies don't ask, how are you, with a, you know, really <laughs> wanting that genuine answer. And that is such a simple, basic thing. Uh, but even if, if you need to remind, you know, folks just to, to start every check in with how are you and how can I help and, you know, incorporating a few minutes of that personal conversation uh, before diving into the work and then, you know, sharing how you're really doing, too. I lied. There's one more. So four. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of times uh, folks don't know how to find mental health resources at their companies. Um, so as a manager, you always want to know where those are and how to point people in that direction. Well, that's great. I mean, there's resources typically within most companies or uh, that are available. And again, come back to, you know, the great work you're doing with, with Mindshare Partners. And we thank you uh, for all of that, Kelly, as well. So um, as, as we start near in the end of our discussion, we're always interested in, in, in the self-care tactics of successful people. You've, you've built this amazing organization. You, you know, you're busy. You, you've got a busy life. Walk us through the practices that you find help you personally to thrive. Absolutely. I think the first thing that uh, that I really, really emphasize, uh, in part because of that terrible experience uh, at, at my previous employer, is that I never miss therapy. So I go to my therapist, well, virtually now, uh, every two weeks um, without fail. And so that is really something proactive I do um, typically in a preventive way. And that used to be the first thing to go when I got busy. And now it's absolutely the last and really implementing those tools that I've used at therapy on a regular basis. Um, I'm pretty good about sleep. Uh, I also have stayed on my medication 
Um, and then, you know, I, uh, I like my mindless TV shows and uh, con- <laughs> connecting with friends who may live far away. I've, I've found um, that I need to be intentional in doing that because I don't have a ton of time. I have two little kids. Um, and so oftentimes I will um, connect with them over Zoom after my kids go to sleep. Um, and that's actually been a really nice outlet, especially during the pandemic. Um, two things I should be doing that my therapist would love for me to do that I'm not the best at is regular exercise and meditation. So those have been on my list to try to figure out how to incorporate um, a little bit more regularly. That's great. I, I like the fact that you say, hey, there's still more I can do. You know, I know these other two things uh, and having those rituals are so important. So ridiculously helpful information, amazing organization that you've created. If there's one thing you want people to walk away from from this conversation today, what would that one thing be? Yeah, I think, you know, what is really important to underscore is that at this point, um, you know, mental health benefits are really table stakes. Um, And so, you know, Eight in 10 workers, uh, according to NAMI, don't seek treatment because of fear and shame. And so um, even with the best mental health benefits in the world, uh, many employees won't take advantage of those because of the stigma. And so it's really imperative that we focus on creating that culture of support for mental health. Wonderful. I think that idea of stigma is a huge one that, you you know, you're helping break. And and thank you for the great work you're doing, Kelly. Thank you for being on the show today. This has been just a delight. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, really, it's going to help a lot of people. And and I just want to echo what Adrian said. Thank you so much for, for your good work and sharing your story. I think that that is one of the keys. You know, when the leaders share their stories, it makes it safe for everybody else. So. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for all that you're doing as well. Adrian, what a what a delightful guest. Uh, so insightful and an, an incredible organization. I mean, these are the kinds of things we want to share with our listeners. Very oh, actionable yeah. and, a, and a company dedicated to do it. What what were some of your takeaways? Well, let's let's start with with Kelly's story, which is so powerful. But unfortunately, as you said, so common and it could have been prevented if a leader had understood. I love what she said is that, well, you know, the leader says, well, we've never had anybody. (laughs) (laughs) I remember watching the the movie Eurovision and and uh, Will uh, Ferrell and and one of the characters says, uh, you know, we don't have any gay people in uh, in in Russia. And she goes, that's, <laughs> that's not possible. <laughs> that's statistically very yeah. improbable. And just this, yeah, yeah. And, and, and she's saying, you know, 76% of people are dealing with some form of mental health in the la- issue in the last year. It, it, it has to, you, we have to be more observant. Well, and, you know, as she did take that leave, her anxiety got worse. Why? Because she said, look, it's over. My career's over. Uh, if that doesn't cause you a little anxiety, I, I don't know. What does? I love, too, that she said, uh, keep track of your numbers. Yeah. You know, again, look, there'll be a lot of skeptics out there. Oh, nobody's anxious here. We all support each other. Well, those pulse surveys and, and the, the anonymous stuff, keep track of your numbers because yeah. those numbers are going to tell you what the real story is when people don't feel safe telling you the real story, right? One of the other things she mentioned about culture was that are we observant of emotionally draining work? And yeah. nobody's used that term before, but I think it's just fabulous. Is that, you know, work that's, you know, there's just too much to possibly handle. Oh, we like to make people stretch. Or it's, you know, it's just too mundane. There's no variety. Or, you know, work with no work life balance, et cetera. Are we being aware of work that's emotionally draining? Because we heard that a lot. As we were writing Anxiety at Work, we would, we would hear this from a lot of younger people especially, and nobody seemed to be worrying about this. Well, the, the other thing that I loved is, you know, where you said, uh, tell us how your organization can help. And then she had this list of 15 things. I mean, yeah. and that other than Pulse surveys, it's all free. Yeah. I mean, to your point, be more aware. That constant check-in. I love that she said, look, um, training, be proactive. Uh, communities where people can can share, much like our, you know, global, uh, we thrive together dot global, create safe places. And then that that those social connections. Who, who can I talk to? I, I, I really liked when she said, I connect with old friends. 
You know, I, I need to keep those connections. So often we think we're all alone. We're the only one. And yet there are so many people that care about us, that love us. If we yeah. just reach out, we'd be there for us every time. Uh, yeah, and I knew you'd love that that point about old friends. Right. Where, me, just leave me alone. But <laughs> you, you like friends. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No, it, it was. I, I mean, you know, my parents are now 92. They're thinking, hey, it's time to go into care. And, and I got a wonderful note from my cousin in England, who I haven't seen in years, just expressing support. That reaching out means so much, which I just thought was really powerful. Um, one of the things she talked about was, you know, what managers can do. I thought it was a great question that you asked there. And she was saying, well, first off, don't try and diagnose, right? Mm -hmm. I know you've got anxiety. Um, lead with vulnerability that it's part of the human experience. But but really, you know, talk, if you don't have anxiety yourself, then talk about something that has been hard and make yourself more vulnerable than you've ever been before. Really powerful. Yeah, and she used that word that, you know, we have a whole chapter on this in our book. Uh, ally, be an ally, be a trusted partner. Uh, somebody that you can that you can count on, and with all that sharing, it it is interesting. I I keep coming back to that emotionally draining work. You know, as a manager, are you are you mixing things up a little bit, or do you have this repetitive work that just sucks right. the life out of you? And, and we did. You're right. In anxiety work, we have chapter two is on overload yeah. and what you do about that because it's so prevalent. And there are things we can do, we're just not. Communication keeps coming up again and again. And, and I really appreciate the fact that she said, look, over communicate, you know, be yeah. there, talk to people, simple questions. How are you doing? And then uh, I, I, I really appreciate it at the end when she said, look, having mental health uh, resources, addressing mental health in the workplace is now table stakes. And we're seeing this so much, aren't we? Particularly in the new generations coming to work, say, look, I'm going to be stressed out. Uh, are you, are you going to be there to support me? How are you going to help me? And offering that up right from the get-go is table stakes now. Oh, yeah. And yeah, no, no, we're still meeting managers every every week that say, ah, do we still have to keep doing this? Yes, we're going to be doing this for the rest of your career. Uh, <laughs> because people are finally starting to remove the stigma and talk about this. So big thanks to Kelly Greenwood for coming on today. Uh, special thanks to our producer, Brent Klein, to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find amazing guests like Kelly, and to all of you who have listened in and downloaded the podcast. Yeah, share it with your friends. If you get friends that are suffering, you know that lots so great information on these podcasts and as Kelly would say and it's free why would you not do it God uh, love free yeah. yeah we want to thank our sponsor life guides it's a peer-to-peer -peer community that helps people navigate their their through their day-to-day -day stressors by providing a place of empathy with a guide who's walked in their shoes gotta love that and so you go to lifeguides.com slash schedule a demo and you add the code healthy 2021 and you get two months of free service why not give it a try yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about free all day today, Adrian. <laughs> and again, another shout out to our sponsor, Go Happy Hub, the most inclusive and timely way to communicate and engage directly with your frontline employees. They have a 95% open rate. With Go Happy, you can send text messages that go directly to your people. You can recognize them. You can talk about new hires, celebrate, get the right message to the right people in a timely basis. And again, 60 months, uh, 60 months, 60 days, free trial. <laughs> All you got to do is say Adrian or Chester sent you. That's Go Happy Hub. We love our sponsors. We do. And thank you all again who have joined us today. Uh, we will talk to you next week with another great guest. And until then, we wish you the best of mental health. Take care and be well. Mm -hmm.